Hello, my name is Tangham Debonair. I am a Member of Parliament. Um, I am the Member of Parliament for Bristol West. I also have the very strange role of being called something called the Shadow Leader of the House of Commons. In shorthand terms, that means that when Jacob Rees-Mogg stands up, I stand up on the other side. I wanted to, to talk about um, the route into feminist politics and then on to political feminism and whatever that is. I'm going to give you a few examples. We can then pick them apart. I started this outline months ago, months and months and months ago, and I planned a nice little whistle-stop tour around the history of parliamentary feminism. And then everything sort of changed in August um, because the consequences of being a woman MP, of being a feminist ally in Parliament, felt very, very different when the fall of, uh, fall of Kabul in particular, but the fall of Afghanistan happened. Um, I've been in touch with a lot of colleagues, and I call them colleagues with purpose. So members of parliament of the uh, members of parliament in Afghanistan who are now dispersed. Some of them are on the run. Some of them are in disguise. Some of them are in hiding. Most of them, either they or their families, have been threatened with um, physical violence, torture, death, and they're in a lot of difficulty. And it would be easy for me to despair. And at the moment, I am just slightly on the edge of despair because I'm trying to help people to get to safety and it's proving incredibly difficult. I could talk more about what I think the government has, our government has done to make it more difficult, if you want. But I'm going to try and park that for the moment, otherwise it will be a bad start to this, this, this talk. Um, but my previous work with violent men, I learned that the best predictor of future risk of violence was past behaviour. Now, I'm speaking very specifically about men whose ideology is about violence and whose beliefs are about women being lesser. And so, although I know there were people who around the fall of Kabul thought maybe this is Taliban 2.0, I never did. And so, in fact, we find it is. And as a feminist MP, what I wanted to do was to try and get everything I could sort of focused on women in Afghanistan who had given up, in many cases, every semblance of freedom and safety and their family's freedom and safety to try and make for their country a better world. And I felt that one of the things that really annoyed me was some of the ideology was that we had somehow imposed on Afghanistan and on Afghan women in particular a very Western notion of equality, which I felt really ignored the history of Afghanistan and Afghanistan, Afghan women's campaigning. Um, take a look at it sometime if you want to know more about what I'm talking about. But it also ignored the fact that they'd created their own democracy, no matter how imperfect, and it was, all democracies are, it had been built for Afghanistan. It had been constructed by Afghans. I have read the standing orders, which is now a bit of a joke, but I have read the Afghan parliament standing orders, and they're not ours. It's a very different way of doing things. And it upset me that I thought there are women particularly, but also men involved in Afghan politics and campaigning for social change, whose lives are now at serious risk. And we have an ideology which does not serve the Afghan people that I've spoken to, certainly, and which we seem to be relatively powerless to stop. And as an actor, because I consider myself an actor, not a commentator, I'm a parliamentarian, I'm supposed to be an actor, I'm supposed to be not just an activist, I'm supposed to be an actor, that's very very difficult to take. But I'm going to go back to where I wanted to start, which was in 1916. Um, a group of women from the Cooperative Women's Guild were in Parliament. And they were in Parliament because they had successfully lobbied for an amendment to a social security bill, it's called something slightly different, to give women, for the first time, a single maternity payment to be paid to them. And they were sat in what I think was committee room 14, a room I know very well. And they're at the back because they are spectators, not actors. So they're not allowed to speak. And what they saw was of those men, of course, they were all men at that point, who were speaking. The men who spoke against a maternity payment being paid to women were their Labour colleagues. And that inspired them. And I consider myself part of that tradition. My grandmother was very much part of that tradition of co-op women's guilders. They said, well, up with this, we cannot put. If we can't be, if we can't influence change enough by being spectators and campaigners, we have to be actors, we have to be in the room, not looking at the room. So some of them then, in fact, did stand for Parliament. And as I'm very fond of saying, I don't think there's any reason not to admit this to you all, I've said this many times to my colleagues in the Labour Party, it's 105 years on and I'm still occasionally having to say to you guys, stop telling me we'll get round to women's equality. Stop telling me that. Because that's what those women faced. There were eight of them who were elected in 1924 and they were stunning women and they, with one exception maybe, very 
just didn't really ever make it to the prominence that their talent and skill and determination deserved. They were constantly told, you know, get, you, you'll, we'll get around to it, we'll get around to it. And I first got, um, I pet bared my own witness to this when I was a, a young feminist working at Women's Aid National Office trying to lobby for changes to protect victims of domestic violence. And I sat in, um, if you've ever been in Parliament, there's a sort of raked audience bit at the top. I sat there. Those days there wasn't a screen. And I watched Paul Boateng, now Lord Boateng, at the dispatch box that I now get to stand up every week and, and feel slightly awed by, saying things that I'd written. I mean, we'd given him lines. But he was the one who got to decide whether or not that, that amendment got pushed, whether that law got through. And that also inspired me. It sort of lodged in the back of my brain. Also, something weird happened that night. Lord Russell, who'd been working with us in the House of Lords, took me and my colleague Nicola. It was about three o'clock in the morning when the bill ended. Took us to tea in what I now realise was the House of Commons uh, cafe, cafeteria. And when we came back through Central Lobby, I heard and saw what I swear was Shirley Bassey singing Goldfinger. I'll never know for sure, because I've asked loads of people, were you there, do you remember? Um, and now fast forward and I'm learning how to take my feminism into Parliament. I'm still learning. I've been an MP for six years, I'm still learning. Because I spent the intervening time in, in professional feminism, in feminist activism, mostly working in violence against women and girls, latterly for 10 years working with violent men, actually. And that was a very interesting way of doing what I always thought of as sharp end, front edge feminism, because you've got misogyny right there in front of you in the room. Uh, usually that meant being in there on a Monday night with 16 uh, very violent men. Uh, with a co-gendered uh, co-facilitator, so it was always one man, one woman. So one of the things we were doing, and we had to work on this, was how do you represent gender equality between a man and a woman? What does that mean? What gift is it? And we did see it as a gift that you are giving to men in the room, many of whom had never seen that in their own lives. What does it look like? So it looked like lots of things. It looked like him being able to cope if we disagreed and not get threatening or violent. Me being able to be heard, him getting that I had as much right as him to be heard, but him also getting that a lot of the work was his and the men's to fix. It wasn't my job as the woman in the room to fix their sexually abusive behaviour. So that meant we had a pre-agreement in certain parts of the 32 weeks that he would lead some things because it was important that it was a man showing the men this is our problem to fix. But also that when I wanted to, I could say, hang on a minute, that's not quite how we see it or how I see it or how other women have told me they see it, even if I didn't. So I've tried to take this into politics. And I think it's got parallels of being a feminist researcher as well as a feminist activist. So what questions are you asking? Who are you asking them of? Who are you listening to? What is your intellectual framework? Through what sieve of analysis of your data are you working? Who are you listening to? Who are you shutting up? Who are you silencing? And part of that, I think, is about the processes of who you talk to as an MP. Who do you, who do you, whose voice do you let into the room? Whose voice do you shut out? Because if you see a panel on any given topic, let's say it's tech, let's say it's science, and all you see are men, or you see that it's a panel on politics and all you see are men, you reinforce your idea of who it is to be a scientist, a tech specialist, um, a politician. And it's frankly no longer good enough just to say, oh, it's so hard to get a woman who's expert on this. No, it isn't. So I made a hard and fast rule and I've stuck to it, including rather awkwardly when a lovely lot of volunteers at a library were doing a sort of, we were doing a what's your favourite book and I looked at the programme and said, well, six men, one woman, I'm not doing it. And they said, we're just volunteers, what are we supposed to do? There's not many women in politics. And it was, you know, it was a, it was a what's your favourite book as a politician. And I said, there are actually plenty, just make more effort. I'm only the 408th woman ever to have been elected to Parliament. 408. Just bear in mind there are 650 each Parliament. When I was elected, there were more men in the room than had ever been elected, the, the number that had ever been elected as women. Okay? So that's terrible. That's centuries where we were not visible, we were not heard, we were not present. Why does that matter? What gets left out? I can tell you lots of things get left out when there's no woman in the room to say, hang on, what about this? Hang on, what about that? And they're often not things that some people call women's issues, but they are things that we tend to spot without stereotyping my own sex too much. There is just something that happens when there are literally no women in the room. There's also something, by the way, that happens when there is no di diversity on other um, spectrum as well. 
Uh, so that's one of the things we do. I think we also need to amplify each other's voices, even when we disagree. I have a principle when I'm chairing that I um, warn you now, always take the first question from a woman. It's not because I think we're less confident. It's just that I have noticed from bitter experience, if I take the first question from a man, there somehow seems to be a sort of unwritten tone. Now, we're going to be fine, by the way. Men, please ask questions. I'd rather you did or make points, but I will be taking the first point from a woman. So bear that in mind. Um, I mentioned modelling gender equality with men in Parliament when I first arrived. I thought, how do you do that? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.